Good morning. All right, well, we'd like, to get, uh, we'd like to get started this morning, and I know some of you are still looking for seats, and I, I hate to say it, I just don't think there are any more available. Um, so if you'd be willing to, to stand in the lobby and listen, you could take it in and, and then join the, the march at the end. It's good for us to be together, isn't it? We need to be together. My name's Rob, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Martin Luther King uh, Day event here in Davis. I think it's the 23rd year we've been doing this, and we're blessed, we're blessed to have all of you present with us. It's, it's an honor for us as a city to be able to host people from Davis and beyond this event. This year's theme, or this year's title, is Justice Everywhere. It's right on your program. Justice everywhere, speaking up for justice in a climate of intolerance. One of my favorite quotes by Dr. Martin Luther King, which is a quote that expresses a hope that maybe is not always seen, but a hope is not always seen. Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I <clears throat> I take that as a matter of faith. Singer-songwriter Jackson Brown wrote in his song the word justice. Does the word justice mean anything to you? He wrote, I'm waiting for the time to come when the word will be real for everyone and not just a word but a thing that can be done. Justice must be won. Justice. Does the word justice mean anything to you? If you're here today to celebrate the life of a great man of justice, then I assume the answer is yes. It means something to me. So perhaps the question should be, what does it mean to you? What does the word justice mean for you, for us in the city of Davis, in the county of Yolo, in the state of California, in the United States, what does the word justice mean for us today? Now, you received a note card when you came in, right? A note card and a pencil. We're going to bring up the lights, and what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a few minutes before we get rolling to write on that card, what does justice mean for you? It might be a word. It might be a short sentence. It might be something more. What does the word justice mean to you? And then what we're going to do, at the end, there's going to be two baskets like this sitting out there with a little sign that says, the word justice means, and, and I'm going to ask you to drop your cards into them. Now, you may want to write it now, or you may want to wait to be inspired by what you're going to hear in the next few minutes from our speakers and our singers. But before you leave, please write what does the word justice mean to you on that card? And then here's what I'm going to commit to doing with those cards. I'm going to take those cards. I'm going to have a little party. I'm going to sort them all out. I'm going to derive and understand what the themes are. And then I promise we're going to share, we're going to share your words of the meaning of justice with this entire community. So that what we testify to today about what it is that we want to achieve in seeking justice can be shared with the entire community who's not here today. Will you do it? Yeah. All right, take a few minutes. Really, we're just going to take a few minutes. You want to turn to someone next to you and say, what does justice mean to you? That'd be fine. But eventually, I'd like you to get it on a note card and drop it in the basket when you leave. You got two minutes right now.
The word justice, what does it mean to you? You have one minute. I'm waiting for a time to come when the word w will be real for everyone and not just a word, but a thing that can be done. Justice must be won. Justice. What does the word justice mean to you? So thank you for participating in that. Please, before you leave, finish it and drop it in the basket, and we'll offer a gift of our understanding of justice to our entire community in the coming weeks. I'd like to introduce now Gloria Partida. Gloria. And just saying that name should elicit applause in this place. Gloria Partida. She doesn't like when I do that. I have deep affection for Gloria because she's, she's a role model for me. She's faced adversity, and instead of turning inward, instead of nurturing a hurt that she was well worth nurturing, would have been well worth nurturing, she took the hurt and she turned it into actions of justice in our community. Maybe that's the definition of justice. <laughs> a person who will take the hurt. That's right. A person who will take the hurt and turn it into good. Gloria will continue to make a positive impact on Davis as the founder of the Davis Phoenix Coalition, advocating for those with disabilities, advocating for those in the LGBTQA community, She's a member of the Human Relations Commission of the City of Davis, and this year is the recipient of the Brinley Award for her work in social justice in our community. Gloria is going to be the MC today. She's standing in the breach. Welcome her and thank her for being here with us. Okay, I'm kind of short if people haven't noticed, so... Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it warms my heart to see so many people here showing up for justice. Uh, we are very crowded, so if there are seats that are open, can you please raise your hand and uh, let people know that there are, are there's still spaces. I can still see seats up here. So if you're in the back and you're looking for a seat, let people know, please. OK. So which is not very accurate right now. We've had a number of illnesses. And um, so please uh, roll with us. We're professionals here. We're going to get through this. OK. So um, I'd like to thank our elected officials. You just heard one of them, which is our Mayor Rob Davis is here. <laughs> and also um, Cecilia Aguilar-Curry is here. I'm not sure. There she is, way in the back. All right. It's really important for our, um, our community leaders to show up and support. It, it promotes not only their personal values, but also the values of the communities they represent. So it's always good to see them in support. All right. So first up, we had Alita Simon, who unfortunately is ill. But I'd like to welcome Erica Ballinger, who is stepping in in her place. And this is actually um, Alita's mom. And uh, they're a very musical family. And so she will um, kick us off. Good morning. Um, my 15-year-old daughter, Alita, was scheduled today. Um, unfortunately, she's, she's sick. Um, she had uh, 
last spring she had started writing a song that she was going to share today. Um, and it was around the time when it seemed that probably every week we were turning on the news and seeing that um, uh, an unarmed young black man was being killed by the police. And she wrote a very moving uh, song in response to that. Um, and unfortunately, I won't have something quite as profound, but I am here so that we ensure we start the celebration off with song. And uh, this, is, this is an original piece that I wrote uh, a few years back um, that was inspired by a book I read um, written by Bell Hooks, um, feminist, cultural critic, scholar, um, and it, the book was called All About Love, in which uh, she, in an effort to explore different aspects of love, not simply romantic love, but looking, looking at a deep level culturally um, on that topic. And um, and, and that's, uh, that song is what that that uh, I'm sorry. That book is what inspired me with this this piece.
Thank you, Erica. So as Rob mentioned, this is a program that is uh, put on by the City of Davis Human Relation Commission. The Human Relation Commission is um, all volunteer, and there are a number of HRC members here that I would like to thank. Uh, if you can stand up, and we can say thank you to you. See you there. The function of the Human Relation Commission is to promote mutual respect, understanding, and tolerance among all persons, and to build a community where diverse people are valued by all. All right, so we are super excited about our next group up here. Um, I'd like to introduce the children of the parents of, American, of African American children of Davis. PAACD is a social group that brings together parents, caregivers, and kids for friendship, support, and fun. They welcome working and at-home parents and caregivers to join to build lasting friendships, create a supportive community, grow together with our children, and celebrate our African-American culture and heritage. Families from all neighboring communities are welcome. Today, the children will read, I Have a Dream. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree became as a great beacon of a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in flames of withering injustice. It came a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the life of the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of the vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall here. This note was the promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note in so far as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. And so, we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon the demand of riches, of freedom, and the security of justice. We've also... We have also come to this hall... We have also come to this hot spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage the luxury of cooling off or taking the, the tranquilizing drug of grazism. Now is the time to make real promises of decamers. Now is the time to rise from the dark and disoiled from the <coughs> valley of segregation of to the sunless path of rest. Racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice in reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This swearing time, sultering summer is Negro's ligament discount. Discount.
discount it. It will not pass until there's an navigation autumn of freedom and equal. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning, and those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam will now be content. We'll have a rude awakening if the nation returns to menace as usual. There will be neither rest or tranquil in America until the Negro grants his citizenship, citizenship rights. The one world of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the worn threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of our wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high planes of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the, ne the Negro com community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that, shall all, that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We will never be satisfied as long as uh, the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies heavy with the fightage of travel cannot again load in the mortals of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We can we can cannot be satisfied as long as the Negroes basic Mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are striped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity <coughs> by signs stating for whites only. For whites only? We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, no. We will not be satisfied. We should not be satisfied until justice rolls down the river of days like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and get ghettos of our northern city. Knowing 
knowing that this somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted within the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, women, and children are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, uh, sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream today. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right, uh, right down there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream. I have a dream today. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The right place will be plain and the crooked place will be, will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be relieved and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This, this is the faith that I will go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hear out of the mountain of the spirit, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jingle of the schools of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to, to stand up for freedom to go in, knowing that we will be free one day. And this will be the day. And and this will be the day, and this will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis three land of liberty, they all sing. Then my father died, the other of the pilgrims pride from every mountain side let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from the lookout mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
free at last. Calling you Lord Almighty, we're free at last. Stage left. Stage left. Wow. I really um, don't envy the person who's coming on after them. <laughs> um, I'd also like to give a shout out to John Saylor, a county supervisor who is out there somewhere. I'm not sure. Thank you for joining us. Next, I'd like to welcome Jessa Ray Growing Thunder. Jessa Ray Growing Thunder comes from the Fort Peck. Essie Boni Sue, I'm sorry, uh, of Northeastern Montana. She's a third generation traditional artist and is famously known for her beadwork and quill work. She has won countless awards with her art and has shown her work in numerous museums like the, like the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, where her work is in the permanent collections. Jessa Ray is currently pursuing her doctorate in Native American Studies from the University of California, Davis, where her research focuses on oral history and American Indian art. Boy, what a tough act to follow. Um, I just want to acknowledge the young people that were up on stage. Can we give them another round of applause? I acknowledge them because uh, they are the next leaders of our communities and of our country. Um, and I thank them for getting up on stage and having the courage to use their voice in that way. Um, it's really, truly inspiring to me. oyate. <clears throat> Ihana, long ago, there was only Ia. Before all the creation we see today, there was only Ia. Louder! <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah, all right, we'll make sure to project. Long ago, there was only Ia. Before all the creation we see here today, Ia in our language refers to the rocks and the stones. So the, the pieces of gravel that you see on the ground, the rocks and the stones that you see scattered all throughout this world, they are only remnants of what Ia used to be. Long ago, Ia was whole, and he was powerful. And Ia lived in a world of darkness with only himself. Until one day, Ia decided to create he created a sphere, and one half of that sphere would be maka, would be land. The other half would be mani, would be water. And so Ia lived with his creation for some time, but they still lived in a world of darkness. And in our traditions, we must always balance things. So to balance this world of darkness, Ian created daylight. He created daytime so that they could have nighttime. So Ian and his creation lived like this for some time. Until one day, Maka, land, asked Ian to create more. She said, Ian, I am naked. I ask that you create things upon me to clothe me. And Ia heard Maka, and he said, if I do this for you, Maka, you must promise 
to always nourish the life that I create upon you, to always look after it, to always protect it. And Macaw said, of course, I will always do this. So soon, Ia created mountains. He created the grass, the trees, the plants, the animals. And with each new creation, all the others gathered to greet it and welcome it to this new world. And towards the end of this creation, Ia created woman, Wea. He created woman to mimic Maka. Woman would have the ability to create life, to nourish life. And because we must always balance this world, Ia soon created man. And man would be mimicked to the universe because the universe protects Maka, protects Grandmother Earth. So Ia did this and created all that we see here. And with each new creation, Ia gave a little bit of himself. He used his own blood to create every single thing we have here today. And soon he was so drained that he shattered all across the world, all across Makkah. And so these little stones, these little pieces of rock that you see everywhere you step are only remnants of what Makkah, or of what Ia used to be. They serve as reminders of our position and our roles together. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today. I want to thank all the young people for being in this room, all the mothers and the fathers, the aunties and the uncles and the grandparents. I want to thank you all for being here today. Now more than ever, we need these types of spaces to talk about unity and solidarity and justice, equality. These are important things to gather and talk about. I come from the Dakota Nakota peoples. I am a Cinnaboyne and Sioux. I'm sure we have all heard about what has happened in Standing Rock since April 1st of last year. And it's been a remarkable journey since then. I've had the opportunity to be there, to be there with my relations. And it was the most beautiful sight I have ever seen to walk into Ochete Shekanwi camp and hear old people and young people speak my traditional language, to watch people from all over the world gather together to feed one another, to look after one another, to create relations, to build families and communities. What is happening out there is a complete and utter change. As a young person, I've always had a dream. I've always had a dream that we live in a world where we're all equal, where every single person's rights and happiness matter. And what has happened since April 1st of last year is the right movement towards that. The fight isn't over. We still have thousands of relations out there. The pipeline may have been halted temporarily, but the fight's not over. We still have a lot of work to do. And even though we're not physically there with all of my relations, we're here. We're in this room right now with one another because we believe in this dream. What I've seen out there and what I see in front of me right now reassures that. So as a young person in this generation, the generation that is gonna change all future generations, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for all that you're doing. But I ask 
that we keep in mind, it's not over. We still have so much to do. And we all have a part in that. Our future is bright. Our young people up here just demonstrated that. So I ask that we continue to do these, these spaces, these conversations. I ask that we continue to work with each other to make sure that those young people have that future. With that being said, I still can't thank you enough for this right now. You happy chante washte, padamia. With a good heart, I thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jessa Ray. So please join me in welcoming Mark Cass, who will be singing Lift Every Voice and Swing Low. Mark has worked in broadcast and performing technology since high school, where he was a DJ, host, and producer of a weekly radio show. He then began working for the Long Center Theater and Elliott Hall of Music. After moving to California, he combined his experiences and created Davis Youth Media at Harper Junior High School. Currently, he is an educator for Davis Joint Unified School District. You might also see his band, The Dirt Feeling, playing at festivals on the weekend or find his paintings at local galleries. So, welcome, Mark. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let us march on loud as the roaring seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun, of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming forth to carry me home. Help me out. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming forth to carry me home. Oh, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Wait, 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 wait. Let me get a gospel clap. If you should get there before I do, coming forth to carry me home.
Well, that certainly woke us up. <laughs> All right, uh, next on our program is Mandel, and unfortunately Mandel uh, was ill today, and we're hoping that uh, he is feeling better. Um, I now have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker, Garth Lewis. Garth Lewis is a grateful husband of 20 plus years and proud father of two daughters. He is the former Sacramento State University co-coordinator of the Matsuyama University and CSU Sacramento Language and Cultural Exchange Program. Over a span of 22 years, he has been a K-12 classroom teacher and school site administrator in South Sacramento a school site and a district administrator in Woodland, and now serves as the Assistant Superintendent of Instructional Services for the Yolo County Office of Education, where he oversees programs serving incarcerated and expelled youth in Yolo County, supports school districts in various initiatives, and partners with agencies to work on equity issues throughout the county. He is also a founding member of African American Students into Higher Education, a local organization illuminating a counter narrative to the crisis of Amer African American student achievement in schools by focusing on three core areas, college and career planning, leadership development and empowerment, and hope and healing. Thank you, Garth. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, we do come from a call and response tradition. So one more time, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, just to clarify, uh, for those of us who, who aren't aware, Lift Every Voice and Sing is the black national anthem, uh, which is why we stand up out of respect and uh, join in lifting our voices in that, uh, in that piece. Uh, I'd like to thank the city of Davis for taking time to remember and honor Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, a true American hero as part of your community's commitment to social justice and to equity. And I also want to say that uh, we know that Dr. King fought for the rights of many people, regardless of race and, and religion, uh, and we know that folks are under attack uh, in these days and uh, in solidarity with our Muslim brothers and sisters out there, I'd like to greet you by saying assalamu alaikum. <laughs> My family and I are honored to be here uh, today with you in remembrance of such a great man who made the ultimate sacrifice for truth and justice. Today's theme, Justice Everywhere, speaking for justice, speaking up for justice in a climate of intolerance is a very appropriate call to action. For when justice and freedom are taken for granted, they are threatened. When taken for granted, these basic human rights are vulnerable to be abused by those with power with impunity. In the words of Dr. King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And you don't have to look too far to understand that we are living in, a, in a, a time of intolerance. You can just check your social media feeds to find plenty of people talking past one another, disrespecting one another, and highlighting differences in a way that divides rather than unites. Let me go on record also this morning to say that Congressman John Lewis deserves the respect of every American in this country, period. Today we are here to celebrate a man who unjustifiably was threatened, violently attacked, and eventually assassinated for his genius and his God-given ability and calling to liberate those who had been oppressed, marginalized, and forced to live as second-class citizens under the threat of violence. And while there are other great Americans, we come together to celebrate Dr. King specifically for the ideals and principles for which he fought and the sacrifice which he made. His dream that we would not be judged by our so-called race, 
but by the content of our character, Steele provides us with a standard to which we should all aspire. I can remember the day when I myself became really cognizant of race and its implications for my life. I was in middle school and was walking home to my grandmother's house with my friend Gustavo after school. And as we passed a house where an, an older white man was out in his front yard, he looked up at us with what we both immediately interpreted as hatred in his eyes. And I do not know what possessed us to do what we did next other than foolishness, childhood foolishness. But we decided to run down the street where one of, one of our white classmates was standing and tell him to pretend like we were beating him up, all the while looking down the street to see whether this man was paying attention or not. Well, he was. And he jumped, out of, he jumped into his truck and chased us down. He pulled up and cornered us with his window down and yelled, you effing nigger and spick. I should get out of my truck and beat your heads in. And by the time he got his last word out, we had taken off running again. Fortunately, he didn't come after us. We must have run a half a mile before we stopped and, and started walking again. But that day, I understood that in this life, not only would I be accountable for my actions, I was also going to have to deal with other, how others perceive me. And while this experience pales in comparison to what those who Dr. King marched with experienced, it makes me appreciate his courage to stare down hate even more. In relation to today's theme, there are three attributes from Dr. King's life and work that I'd like to draw on as compelling reasons for us to speak up for justice. One, his, prof his profound empathy for others. Number two, education for a purpose. And number three, hope for the future. Dr. King's profound empathy is evidenced by his selfless acts of love that he showed in the face of adversity. I was not alive when Dr. King was assassinated. However, our lives are forever entwined. For had it not been for his empathy that caused him to look into the future and understand the impact of an unjust system and the impact it would have on generations to come and work toward disrupting that challenge, that system, I'm not sure that I would be standing here before you today. Had it not been for his willingness to stand in, with dignity and courage in the face of loathing and senseless attacks on behalf of others, I believe we would not be witnessing the close of the second term of America's first African-American president. My wife and I shed tears while hugging our daughters on the night of President Obama's election. And we will always treasure being able to hear his first Memorial Day address at Arlington Cemetery Along with, the girls, along with our girls and students from Lee Middle School that were there with us on that day. I'm grateful for the fact that Dr. King answered the call to step into a role that required fortitude and courage. And at the same time, as a naturally curious educator, I'm always trying to understand the why behind the things that I observe. Why did he show that level of empathy? Why would a man who could have chosen an easier path decide to lay down the privilege he could have enjoyed as an extraordinary orator and highly educated Baptist minister with a promising future if he had decided to pay attention to only what was going on in his church? Why would a young husband and father make the choice to use his very body as the tool to bring about change in a time in which a black life meant very little in mainstream America. In my estimation, Dr. King was compelled by at least two powerful forces. One, his faith in God, and two, the context in which he lived. Regarding his faith, he understood that the word of God was to be lived, not just heard. In the words of Jesus Christ, greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Dr. King was fully aware of the danger 
the work he committed himself to present it. Yet he willingly offered his body in direct action against the oppressive system of racism and segregation. And although, nearly, although in the early years of his work, he articulated this commitment, eight years into his 13-year journey as a civil rights leader, he was still trying to help those who did not understand his commitment to empathy as an action word and, comp and help them comprehend why he would choose to bear such a heavy burden on behalf of others. In an excerpt from his piece, Letter from Birmingham Jail, Dr. King argued, perhaps it is easy that for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothered in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that had just been advertised on television and see the tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Funtown is, is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form over her little mental sky. When your mother and wife are not given the respected title, Mrs., and when you are forever fighting a degenerative sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Dr. King's words clearly articulated his why. His argument to his critics was compelling and unarguably true. His empathy radar had been activated and he could not ignore it. And even though the context of the day was one of constant physical and mental and spiritual danger, for the American citizen of African descent. Simply because of the color of his skin, through his faith in God and living out his convictions, Dr. King turned a mess into a message. A message that is still relevant in our country to this day. A message that calls all of us to speak up for marginalized communities and calls for us to speak up for justice. <clears throat> As I was preparing uh, for this morning, I tried to do so without fully wearing my teacher hat, but I just couldn't help myself, so I've got some homework for you. I actually felt a little bit better once I saw the mayor giving you some homework uh, as well. <clears throat> here are two things that we can do to build empathy in our communities, and, and we, see, we have seen evidence of this today here in Davis. Having conversations with folks who don't look like us, who don't believe like us, on things that are not just on the surface. And I think sometimes in this day and age of social media, we think that we know one another simply because we're following each other's Facebook page or Twitter feed. But do your coworkers know what really fuels your fire? Do they know that you stand for justice? So having those conversations. We also would like, I would also like to encourage you or invite you to uh, visit empathy.com uh, as a way to build a library and ex of experiences for uh, inspirational films and, and books and also get a chance to see the life of others uh, through that perspective. And in this way, it's like the six foot tall kindergarten teacher who shows humility of heart and body by kneeling down to consider the world from his student's perspective, acknowledging the limitations of a single point of view from, a person, from the person with the most power in the room. On the value of a purposeful education, obviously highly intelligent and well-educated himself, when a student at Morehouse College, Dr. King wrote a paper on the importance of education in which he argued that intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. And Dr. King's life serves as a model of his words in action. He took his diploma, his bachelor's degrees, his PhD, and bundled, them up, all, bundled up all those hours of study and training and released, 
released them into a mo movement that changed this country and world forever. A free public education is not only the one of the major cornerstones of our democracy, but in my estimation, it is likely the best means of bringing Dr. Dream's, Dr. King's dream to fruition. Yet the reality of this work is not and will not be easy. In 2017, a gap uh, for school achievement and opportunity still persists along the color line. Outcomes for youth in the aggregate are still predictable based upon the color of one's skin and zip code. One of my favorite educators, Dr. Ron Edmonds, is quoted as saying, we can whenever and wherever we choose successfully teach all children whose schooling is of interest to us. We already know more than we need to know to do that. Whether or not we do it must finally depend upon how we feel about the fact that we haven't so far. What do we know about what works about education? We know that preschool matters. And this is especially important for children of color and those living in poverty who can, sometime, who can oftentimes arrive to school 14 months behind their more affluent uh, peers when it comes to kindergarten readiness measures. Yet according to a, rep a, title, a, a report titled, Do the Math, Schools Versus Prisons, in 2014, the state of California spent 12 times as much on prisoners as we did on preschoolers. Let's work to move that funding upstream. This is a worthy objective of an educated mind. What else do we know about education? We know that literacy matters. In 2015, on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, fourth grade black and Latino students qualify, and students qualifying for free and reduced lunch in California had an average score 30 points below their white and more affluent counterparts, respectively. Their performance gap was not significantly different than that in 1998, 17 years earlier. The fact is that these fourth graders who do not meet that reading benchmark today are more than likely destined to become our lowest paid citizens of tomorrow. We have to work together to change that outcome and disrupt generational poverty. Let's work together for literacy for all. That's another worthy objective of an educated mind. The third thing we know is that equity and culturally responsive schools make a difference for children. We know that it makes a difference for their outcomes and changes, to, changes the general patterns of school achievement for youth of color and those that are living in poverty. Contrary to what some have believed prior to the rhetoric that we were subject to during the most recent election and since then, we do not live in a colorblind nor bias-free society. And our children definitely do not attend color, colorblind and bias-free schools. Just this month, the Atlantic uh, Magazine reported on the importance of, of race discussions in the classroom. And while teachers overwhelmingly agree that that's a topic that should be discussed in schools, they felt woefully unprepared to do so and strongly reject discussing racial violence. We know that the material conditions of our youth's lives, including issues around race, need to be reflected in their learning experience, and that will help all children to thrive. I'll share a quick example of where we see evidence of this right here in Yolo County. On February 4th of 2016, partners from all across the county came together to hold the first annual Yolo County African American Student Leadership Conference. And at this conference, it was on a Saturday, we had over 90 African American, European American, and Latino students show up. And they experienced traditions that were lost when Africans were brought here as enslaved peoples. They experienced a blessing by elders and being draped by African mud cloths as they, were, as they entered to the room. They were provided with materials that were inspiring to them to help them to survive and thrive. 
African drumming, hip hop music, spoken word poetry, and speakers spoke to the material conditions of their lives and engaged them throughout the day. Most importantly, the youth learned about the contributions that African Americans and Africans have made to this country and this world that are oftentimes left out of today's school curriculum. And throughout the day, the youth and parents that were there thanked us for putting together for such, a, such an impactful event. The purpose of this event was to counter the, the, the narrative that is oftentimes spouted by those within and without the educational system regarding apathy for our, that our youth may have. I believe that based upon the fact that we have so many kids that are coming back this next year, uh, to this next year's event, that it's not that our children are apathetic towards education, but it's, be, it's that the system has not changed enough to be able to engage them and then we have to work on those conditions. When the outcomes of children for education are predictable based upon race and income level, that's a sure sign that the system needs working on, not the children. Let's continue to work to create equity-driven and culturally responsive schools and communities, yet another worthy objective for an educated mind. And even if you're not an educator, we need your partnership in that work. Dr. King's message to us on education was that education for education's sake was a, a bankrupt idea, whereas education for purpose provides hope for a future. Which brings me to the final attribute for this morning, hope for a future. If I could hold a tune at all, I, I would sing, but I can't, so I won't. <laughs> I would sing, we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. Dr. King was an amazing beacon of hope and the human capacity to show restraint and discipline and love in the face of a difficult struggle. His example emboldened and empowered the African-American community and those who stood with them. Empowered them to stand for change. On the day that he delivered his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King was introduced as the moral conscious of our country. And in the process, Dr. King focused the light of truth and mercy on the gloomy reality of racism, segregation, and the oppression of the other. In this way, his work was a next step in the accomplishments of sheroes and heroes like Harriet Tubman, Dred Scott, Nat Turner, W.E.B. Du Bois, Sojourner Truth, and Carter G. Woodson. These warriors of justice are reminders that historically speaking in the U.S., the amount that a life matters has depended upon the color of one's skin rather than the content of one's character. Yet Dr. Dream, Dr. King's dream insisted that the humanity of black people in this country be given as much consideration and dignity as anyone else's. The fight to make the case that black lives in fact do matter has been going on on these shores for over 400 years. Dr. King's work is not done. It's in our hands, yours and mine. And the future of his legacy depends upon not only us taking time to remember him today, but us living out his work on a daily basis. His empathy, the use of an education for a purpose, and hope for a better future. Last week, President Obama reminded us that our Constitution is a great gift because of the ideals that it communicates. Namely, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And at the same time, he acknowledged that we still have a long way to go in ensuring that these words are true for all Americans, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, their ability, 
country of origin or any other difference that might be exploited. Living in a way that recognizes that our common humanity trumps all that could possibly divide us would go a long way toward building that hopeful future. And this morning we invite you to dream. For Dr. King dreamed, he dared to dream, even though he knew that in his lifetime it was unlikely he would see that dream come to fruition. So this morning we do invite you to continue that dream, continue his work, and recognize that his life causes us or calls us to speak up for justice everywhere. This is our time to do our part and to speak up and to use our privilege, our knowledge and influence to work towards justice for all in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you for having me with you this morning and I wish you God bless. Thank you, Garth. So that homework assignment will be collected here next year. We're going to conclude our program today with music played by the ever popular Davis Freedom Singers. When they are done, everybody is encouraged to participate in a short freedom march through downtown Davis. The march will conclude at the East Street Plaza. All right, and here are Freedom Sing Singers. And um, I'd also like to thank each of you for joining us to celebrate diversity. You guys there. Gosh, Davis, you're really looking great. This is the most I've ever seen here. Yes, fantastic. Ages. Woo! Yes. Well done. We've got to be sure that we can all get up and sing really loud, eh? So don't hesitate to, uh, uh, to sing along with us. These are simple songs, and they're going to be repeated over and over, except we'll change a word now and then, and we'll let you know what the word is. This is this little light of mine. Oh, this, this little light, light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Fear. Free of fear and hatred. Free of fear and hatred. I'm gonna make it go. Free of fear and hatred. I'm gonna make it go. I'm gonna make it go. Free of fear and hatred. I'm gonna make it go. Every night, let it shine. All around the world. All around the world. I'm gonna around the world. world. I'm gonna let it shine. All around the world. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. For the poor and hungry, for the poor and hungry, I'm gonna let it shine. 
for the poor and hungry, I'm going to let it shine. For the poor and hungry, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hey, you did a great job. So we're going to sing We Shall Overcome now. We heard about trying to get our last speaker to sing along. He can sing this song. Don't, 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 don't worry about that. Yeah. So the, does this come out as a C there? Is it a C? Does it sound like C? No, it doesn't sound like a C. I'll, I'll play it in C chords. So um, please... If you feel like it, stand up and sing with us on this one, okay? Oh, we shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. be free. We, we shall be free. We shall be free. We shall be free. marching out of the hall, and the one behind that will come right after it, and we'll start walking out the front, and we're going to march all over Davis, about four or five blocks. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so this one uh, is, uh, starts off with the, the concept of, I'm on my way, and I won't turn back. I'm on my way. And John Paprin over there, he, he sang that down in Alabama. Yeah. So Along did you. With, yeah, well, that's got to be good. Yeah, good old John. And how are you doing, John? Are you well today? All right, good, good. So, what key is this one going to be in, you guys? Lewis. G. Yeah, yeah, we were with Mr. Lewis. It's yeah. in G. Yeah, okay, I got it. Yeah, we're still with it. Yay, Lewis. So I'm gonna I'm gonna play it, it easy to down here. Oh, does that sound like it? I'm on my way and I won't turn back. I'm on my way. Oh God, I'm 
I'm going to ask my brother. I'm going to tell Mr. Trump. I'm going to tell Mr. Trump. Won't you go with me? Gonna tell Mr. Trump. Won't you go with me? Gonna tell Mr. Trump. Won't you go with me? I'm on my way. Great God, I'm on. If he said, Gonna ask my sister. Gonna ask my sister. Won't you go with me? Go ask my sister. Won't you go with me? Go ask my sister. Won't you go with me? I'm on my way. Great God, I'm on my way. And if he says no, Gonna go anyhow. Let's hear some clapping. He says no. Gonna go anyhow. If he says no, 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 gonna go anyhow. I'm on my way. Great God, I'm on my way. And I say, come and go with me. Come and go with me to that 